In today's video, we're going to be discussing the best methods of dealing with the Blood Angel Space Marines using the Necron Codex. Hello and welcome to Planet 40k. So we kicked the series off in the last episode with how to deal with the Death Guard army. Then we did a poll and the winner of that poll was the Blood Angels with 59% of the votes. So thank you everyone that got involved in that poll. Keep your eyes peeled for the next one. As always, before we get into today's video, today's random shout out of the day goes to Taik Arama. He's simply enjoying the tactic video, so shout out to you. And also before we begin, again there'll be a small disclaimer here, everything in the video is not by any means going to guarantee you victories, and the advice given is based upon the opposing faction's general feel as a whole. So let's get a brief outline out of the way with the Blood Angels playstyle to begin. Obviously they're one of the many marine chapters which are all very strong in every aspect of the game. Usually they can be steered into any direction they see fit, whether it's a ranged or combat approach, or even with the psychic abilities. Blood Angels however are more geared towards the melee side of things, but you do see some shooter units within their factions, usually something in the form of a backline heavy support gun option. But for the majority, they like to be in combat, there's tons of deep strike options within the chapter, due to the amount of jump pack options from the supplement as well as the marine codex itself. So things like Death Company or Vanguard Veterans, Sanguinary Guard, just to name a few. So expect to be in a fight with units that don't really want to be in a fight. So Space Marine Infantry are what I call standard infantry stats. They hit on threes, toughness four, three plus armor save. So they can be got at, but now that the regular marines have two wounds each, it's made them quite resilient, especially when you start to add any invun saves. So like all factions, they've got their own faction abilities. So the first one being Red Thirst, which I personally think is crazy good. It's a plus one to the advance and charge roll, so those jump back units are now needing an 8 inch charge from Deep Strike. But the main showpiece of the army's abilities is the plus one to the wound roll in melee. Now this only occurs when they made the charge or were charged, or of course heroically intervened, but this alone is insane. If they target our Necron Warriors with a Strength 5 weapon, it usually wounds on 3s but now it's 2s. This is effectively the same as having a Strength 8 weapon versus our Warriors. Even a Strength 6 weapon against our Destroyer Cult units wounds on 2s, as it has the same effect of having a Strength 10 weapon. A plus 1 to wound is extremely powerful. It also helps the Blood Angels player trim down their cost because they don't need to go for all the heavy melee weapons to wound on 2s. They can take cheaper options with things like Astardis Chainsaws and Lightning Claws. And now they're a huge threat because they likely wound on 3s and those kind of weapons are usually free or minimal points in comparison to things like thunder hammers so this in turn allows them to simply have more models with their points that they've saved blood angels also like to be in the assault doctrine so usually turn three onwards is where it kicks in but be aware of the stratagems they have that they can change the doctrines or units such as the sanguinary priest who is their unique apothecary with a jump pack he's got the ability to give a core unit or character nearby the ability to change their doctrine to the assault doctrine which is going to add a minus one IP to all the weapons of that unit. And of course, this also unlocks their super doctrine, which can only happen in the assault doctrine. So their super doctrine is Savage Echoes, which simply gives every model in the unit an extra attack on the charge or if they were charged. So it's the last thing you want to see when a full unit of assault terminators is about to charge you in that doctrine. So the key thing about Blood Angels is the ability to fight, but not just fight, they control the battle as they select what fight they want to be in and where to send the melee units into, so effectively they dictate the battle. You can imagine a lone doomsday arc sitting at the back, minding its own business, in your own deployment zone, and then all of a sudden a unit of sanguinary guard jump down in turn two, make an eight inch charge, and then that arc is toast. Even if it survives the combat, it now can't shoot because it's got the blast weapon, so it's got no option but to fall back, but even then you still can't shoot. Unless you've got some sort of fall back ability, which allows you to then shoot, but it's quite rare within the codex, especially when you're using it on a doomsday arc. So using the protocol of the Conquering Tyrant could be useful here, but this is a pre-assigned protocol, so maybe have this for turn 2, turn 3, depending on who goes first. So how do we deal with the Blood Angel strengths is the question. The absolute main method of dealing with Blood Angels is your deployment. This goes for quite a lot of factions in general really. You can't simply just deploy and expect to win, so you need to have some basic screening to begin with. Now deep striking units need a 9 inch bubble around the entire unit in order to land in a given area. So use this to your advantage, not theirs. What I mean by this is screen off your deployment zone with things that you don't mind being in combat. So deny that 9 inch bubble from the front to the back. But if you want to be a bit more crafty with this you can also set a trap. Now leave a certain spot where you're happy for jump backers to land. Maybe it's an area with not much terrain. But somewhere away from your blast weapons and maybe all the other range units as well. Secondly use things to your advantage. If you've got big vehicles such as ghost arcs or monoliths. Create a barrier that will force the deep striking unit to need to go through it. Yes they can fly. But if there's no landing space behind those barriers, they aren't jumping over. The main source of your screening will come in two ways. Either a large unit spread out and make the biggest footprint they can. So if things like warriors are a really good option here. 
Also flayed ones too, they can do it because they're a 20-man unit. If it is Warriors, then a Royal Warden is probably going to be helpful in this situation just in case they do get caught out. Also, spreading them means that you might get lucky and fall out of combat naturally when you remove models. Then you can reanimate them to the other side of the unit so that you won't be within engagement range even after a Blood Angel's piling. Now, the main use is to go with Scarabs. This is key. These things only cost 15 points a base and you get 4 wounds with each base. So remember what we said at the start of the video, Blood Angels can go cheap with weapons and they still wound well with a plus one to wound. So a lot of Blood Angels players come with the stock chain swords and lightning claws. Those are damage one weapons. Now it's gonna take four of those to go through armor just to remove a single Canoptic Scarab. Even if they were using Thunder Hammers and Power Fists, yes, it's gonna go through your Scarabs much quicker, but now they aren't hitting the prime targets. They're literally removing Scarabs when really they should be going after vehicles and elite models. So they aren't really being efficient with their weapons that they carry. So to utilize the Canoptic Scarabs, you need to firstly put them on your front line, ideally double them up if you can and have two lines of them, but not too close to each other. You don't want the Blood Angel units consolidated into the second unit of Scarabs, and you're also trying to close the space to prevent them from jumping over. Also worth noting here that you have no reason to charge them in your turn. There's no point risking losing a unit in your opponent's turn and freeing them up for the movement. Force them to waste their turn dealing with your Canoptic Scarabs. Each scab unit is effectively one turn wasted. If your scabs survive, fall back and make the Blood Angels unit waste another turn, all while firing all your range attacks from anywhere else. So this brings me on to what units within the Codex we can be using and how. I always seem to start with Warriors as they're most people's foundation of the force. Going against a melee unit that hits hard and fast means we don't really want to be paying taxes for moving our guys, so we don't really need Night Size, we don't even need the Veil of Darkness to move our Gorse Reapers up the board. Now maybe I'd still take the Veil of Darkness Relic, maybe for some late game scoring, but in the early part of the battle, you just need to hold your ground. Warriors are strength 5 with their Gorse Reapers, and you can simply set themselves up, bunker down in your own home objective. You probably need an Overlord for the My Will Be Done so you can hit on 2s. And as soon as one of those jump pack targets are in your face, out in the open, maybe because of a failed charge or the scarabs fell back, you unload your Gorse Reapers, spend the CP on the stratagem for the Gorse Reaper weapons to hit on 6s to auto wound, throw everything at that unit but the kitchen sink. If you don't deal with it, it's going to be a problem. As mentioned already, a Royal Warden is an almost auto include here, as you don't want your warriors anywhere near a fist fight in the battle. In bigger games, I'd even consider two of them. And the Ghost Arcs as well for some extra blockage. This is also going to provide more Gorse and heals your Warriors as well. The Ghost Arcs are more optional here as you can opt for more Warriors instead to provide a larger footprint. Immortals I'd leave at home this time. The units that Blood Angels have are either going to be standard Marine units or Elites with Storm Shields. So either way, mass firepower is better than a slightly higher strength at range. The strength is actually matched by the Warriors Reapers and the range actually isn't needed. So that's the two troop options. What about the rest of the Codex? So the Canoptic Spiders are handy because they've got a source of reproducing more Scarab Swarms which are going to be tying up enemy units and screening your army. As Scarabs are probably the most important cog in this machine, it makes sense to keep churning them out. Spiders are also going to be providing some backline melee defense for a gunline army. Strength 8 Claws are perfect for killing marine infantry because they're wounded on 2s and it's minus 3 AP with 2 damage, all with 5 attacks base. Technomancers are another solid choice, as not only do they bring D3 Warriors back per turn, but they're also buffing the Spiders to make them hit on 3s instead of 4s. They can also take the Failsafe Overcharger to give your Spider D3 more attacks, and if you're taking a unit of 3 Spiders, that's 3 D3 extra attacks at Strength 8. That's definitely going to clear off the Corn Pretending Threat. Sticking with the Canoptic stuff, I'd probably not use the Raves in this occasion, unless they're going and doing their own thing, attacking your opponent's deployment area. You don't really need the speed to defend your own ground, but yes, the inbound save would be nice, especially against mass melee attacks, but you will need to expand that with some units to get scoring. Now, we mentioned flayed ones. They've got a larger footprint as well. 60 attacks from a full unit of 20 means 40 hits and 20 wounds, 10 of which will go unsaved and kill 5 Space Marines. Now, they're going to be the same price as Warriors, but there's two issues with this. Firstly, they're taking up an elite slot, which is probably our strongest battlefield role. And secondly, they're likely the ones that are going to be getting charged, so they're not going to be getting 60 attacks. Once a jump pack unit has dealt its damage, we probably have half the models left at best. If you took the averages of the mass we've just previously done, that would mean two, maybe three Blood Angel Marines will die. Then in the next fight phase, those Blood Angels hit first. So I think that's 260 points down the drain in exchange for maybe 60 to 70 points in return. Ophidian Destroyers have an interesting role here as it's one of the very few threats we have that can get behind enemy lines with their Tunneling Horrors ability. And of course Lich Guard can do it with the Veil of Darkness Relic, but those Ophidian Destroyers are 105 points for the unit and it's going to give your opponent something to be concerned about. They can't really leave their deployment zone unguarded. Now Infiltrators may make this quite difficult, but they are expensive as far as troops go at 24 points a man. 
Now a unit that I always bang on about is the Nightbringer. You can switch him out for the Void Dragon if you prefer, especially if your opponent is bringing Death Company Dreadnoughts or Furiosa Dreadnoughts or even the Librarian Dreadnought. But the fact that the Catan Shards can only lose 3 wounds per phase makes them a solid unit to be dealing with those Deep Strikers, especially the ones that have in-run saves as they can be ignored. Also the Mortal Wound Carnage from the Catan Powers is very effective to bypass those in-run saves. I'd always pay the command point to use the extra power, and if there's a ton of deep strike units in the same sort of area then switch the Catan power to the cosmic fire ability to hit all units within 9 inches, or the sky of falling stars if units are 5 man units and you can select 3 targets within 24 inches. The main threat we have though is the melee weapons that the Catan shards have. This time I probably would charge in, delete the toughest unit entering your area. The only issue that you may face is if the opponent has a Psyker, and dropping 3 wounds in the psychic phase is how Catan shards fall. Both Mephiston and the Librarian Dreadnought are extremely quick and get into combat because they can use the Wings of Sanguinius Psychic ability for an additional move in the Psychic phase and they'll be doing it at 12 inches with the Fly keyword. Yes that's right, there are Flying Dreadnoughts in the Blood Angels supplement, they are rapid. Thankfully Blood Angels tend to use their powers to buff themselves rather than use them for things like Smite as their buffing powers are pretty good. The Quickening gives the Psychers the reroll of the Advance and Charge ability alongside D3 extra attacks. The Shield of Sanguinius is a 5 plus invulnerable save for any Blood Angels unit nearby, so your opponent may opt to put this on the Librarian Dreadnought because he's not actually got an inbun save, because you can only get those inbuilt inbun saves through relics, but he's a vehicle, so he can't take one. So Smites in general are not commonly cast with Blood Angel Psychers, but if they do see a Katarn Shard is in the way, they may sacrifice the extra attacks just to make you lose 3 wounds in that Psychic phase. So long story short, keep your Katarn Shards away from Psychers, and if you're able to target them with your Catan powers, do so. If you go toe to toe with the Psyker, they're going to shorten the Catan Shard's time in the battle. So we've spoken about some of the melee defense, now we need to talk about our bread and butter when defending against the Blood Angels Force, which is our ranged units. Now we've already spoken about the importance of warriors. Tomb Blades can play a similar role to the Ophidian Destroyers, as they're quick and they can attack enemy deployment zones to steal and score points, while also providing some additional firepower to aid our own defense. So it's a solid choice. Just don't let them get caught up in melee as they're likely to go down like a lead balloon. Death marks are also very useful because there's plenty of characters within the Blood Angel supplement and lots of them create these multi-buff combinations. Now characters such as the Sanguinia, a Sanguinary Priest for example, they don't have any inbun saves. But even others that do such as Astaroth or Lamates are still worth firing at because their buff multipliers can be very extreme. The Sanguinary Priest are jump pack apothecaries and they can be made into chief apothecaries so you don't want them bringing back any Sanguinary Guards for example each and every turn as well and getting them into the Assault Doctrine from turn 2 can be a very bad situation for us. The newly priced Locust Destroyers may be worth a punt, now they're only 50 points. So with the Gorse Cannons, with their D3 damage, 3 shots a man, hits twice on average and wounds on 3s. So at least 1 wound, likely 2, but dice are dice. Minus 3 AP is lovely against power armor, but it's just that D3 damage roll I don't trust. But a single Destroyer should be removing a 2 wounded model per turn, potentially 2. If you've got a 3 man unit for 150 points, and if they're defended right, you could be removing 3 to 6 models per turn. This could be about 75 to 100 points per turn, depending on the war gear, so it's not a bad trade off. The heavier variants are situational as they're more anti tank orientated. If they're fielding dreadnoughts, then get the Gorse Destructor. Doesn't look quite as bad now at 60 points. Between a 3 man unit of those heavy destroyers, you can expect about 16 damage. The thing about this is the Blood Angels will be melee heavy, so they won't likely have too much to ping off your long range heavy locust attacks. And if they do so, this is why the Ophidian Destroyers are so key, because they can tie up those units. Another unit that I've never really been that big on, but maybe it's his time to shine, is the Psychomancer. Now with the Harbinger of Despair ability to half the opponent's charge range, could be a good one. I mean this isn't going to work on a deep strike unit because you do it in your own morale phase, but I'm thinking of the second fight if you've lost your screen. The only issue is you've got to be 12 inches away to do it, it's kind of why I dislike it, but if you are half in their charge roll, it's normally a 7 inch average, that's with 2 dice, but it's now going to be a 3.5 average or 4 when you round it up. Another slight issue is Blood Angels get the plus 1 to charge, putting them up to 5, and if you're using chaplains such as Astra for the Canticle of Hate for the plus 2 to the charge, which will overwrite that plus 1 from the red first, that's going to give it a 6 inch charge, so this could work, but I think I'd rather invest in more scarabs, you can get 4 scarab bases for the same price and have some change left over for a coffee. Another cryptic that also isn't on everyone's wish list, which could see some value, is the Plasmancer. Now, the mortal wounds he puts out at close range could be pretty epic, especially when you're defending your ground. Now, the Harbing of Destruction, with three chances of rolling a 4 plus to do a mortal wound, and then the Living Lightning ability to add another one to nearby units, alongside his Lance as well, which is pretty good. 
D3 shots at strength 7, minus 3 AP and damage 2. Now the Royal Warden we've mentioned a few times, but if you are playing the Mephric Dynasty, it could be ideal to go for his Relic, which is the Conduit of Stars, so you're likely going to be getting 6 shots at strength 6, minus 2 AP and 1 damage, it could be minus 3 AP with a Mephric Code. Any extra damage you can cause from your HQs is more than welcome. Triarch Stalkers can also be a worthwhile investment, because you're likely to focus fire on a particular Deep Striking unit entering your area anyway so an army-wide reroll of 1s against that unit is very effective, especially paired with the My Will Be Done ability for your warriors, they don't really miss often. Another one of the big guys which is the Doomstalker, or the Doomsday Arc, use those at your own peril, Blast Weapons versus melee factions for me doesn't really go very well, I'd avoid it in this occasion. Before we talk dynasties, I wanted to add the monolith here. Now, we know our Lord of War models are not that competitive, all, all except the Silent King, of course. But now that the super heavy auxiliary detachment is down to one command point, it makes us revisit the monolith in particular. We all want to see this thing shine once more like it did in its heyday. But against Blood Angels, it actually could shine. It provides a giant wall for starters, so instead of putting the scarabs at the front, you can put them behind the monolith to prevent any jump packs jumping over the monolith. Now, the monolith in combat is an animal. Six attacks that auto hits. And their strength 8, they'll be wounded on 2s against power armoured marines and terminators. So it's minus 3 AP and their damage is 3 each. So terminators in particular are not going to like this one bit. It is a vehicle so you take your 4 gorse flux art weapons and you'll be firing 24 shots at strength 5, minus 2 AP. Only 1 damage but it's still going to remove 3 or 4 models alone. Add the particle whip for 1 or 2 more models. That's all before the melee side of things which could kill another 4 in combat. So if you add all these dead models up, let's say marines are between 20 points and 35 points a man, depending on the unit and the loadout. So that's maybe anything between 170 to 300 points in a single turn. Obviously that's a good turn, and again it depends on the targets. Now not all of these things may even take place, maybe the monolith doesn't get into combat, maybe you whiff your shots. Lots of factors can happen, but I'd say the monolith will make its points back up by turn 3 if you play it correctly. Now the downfall of the monolith is the ballistic skill which brackets, but you do have a stratagem for 2 command points, and you'll be treating it like it's on its full wounds. If the wall stands, the blood angels are not entering. It also doesn't have an in one save, but I don't think that matters too much. Thunder hammers are minus 2 AP, minus 3 AP in the assault doctrine. That still puts your monolith on a 5 plus armor save. Then remember those canoptic spiders we mentioned earlier. Get repairing that monolith and don't forget your living metal. Okay, that's my pitch on the monolith done. Let's talk dynasties. So the one I'd be looking at here is the Mephrit dynasty. 3 inch extra range and anything that's shot at half range is an extra minus 1 AP. And the talent for Annihilation Stratagem is a menace, make his sixes to wound, score mortal wounds. It is capped at three mortal wounds, but against factions such as Space Marines, each wound they have is valuable. Just don't pair this with the Gore Stratagem, as that stratagem allows you to skip the wound roll on sixes, whereas the Mephrit Stratagem requires you to roll sixes to wound so they don't quite synergize as well. But all in all, the Dynasty makes use of that minus 1 AP added to the weapons, and we've already got a decent AP on our Gorse weapons anyway. Now, if you're going Saltec, I don't think they're needed quite as much because you're not firing at further range. All the threats are quite close. I think if you're going Shooty, then you're probably better going with the Mephrit Dynasty. If you did want to go Custom, you've got a movable Phalanx with a plus 1 to your armor save, with your infantry units, paired this with Isolationist, could be ideal getting a plus one strength to all your rapid fire weapons when firing within 12 inch range, which will likely be happening. If you want to be brave and fight hand to hand against the Blood Angels, firstly I'd say good luck, but I will try my best to help you. You've got to go with the Novak Dynasty for the extra minus one AP in combat, or you go custom with Rad Reeved to turn those Blood Angels into toughness three units, or a rise against the Gintelopers to make those sixes to hit and melee auto wound. If you do go Nova, then make use of the Blood Rite Stratagem for more attacks and the Blood Cypher Relic on a character for more attacks as well. But personally, I'd go with the Mephrit Dynasty in this battle. So to cap the video off, I'm not going to do a top 3 units this time, it's more of a top tips. So tip number 1, deal with the oncoming threats one at a time, usually it's the Jump Pack units or the Deep Strike Terminators, but focus fire everything at one at a time. If you're trying to skim them all down, you're probably going to get caught out in a lot of different places and you won't be able to fire in the next round. Keep your eyes on the second wave. It could be more of a slow foot slogging unit such as Blade Guard Veterans or Assault Intercessors, but obviously you're going to prioritise the first ones coming in, but just keep your eyes open. The next thing is to shield your best units, with the Scarabs in particular, and keep falling back with them to allow for your rest of your army to shoot. And Royal Wardens in particular are going to be huge if you want to get your warriors out of combat and still fire. Next you've got double check your protocols. I'm not a big fan of protocols, but there are a few things in there that can really aid you in the early rounds of the battle. Things like falling out of combat and still shooting for example. Then finally, don't forget you need to still score. Use those Canoptic Wraiths or the Tomb Blades. Treat them like they're hobbits on the mission to Mount Doom. They need to survive and score your primaries. Without scoring, everything is lost. Guys, I hope you're enjoying the Know Your Foe videos. Smash a thumbs up and let me know if you have any suggestions. Put them down below. Best comment will get a shout out. 
Also, keep your eyes open for the polls that we're going to be doing. I'll be releasing one soon for the next Know Your Foe enemy. So yeah, guys, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.